very happy to have today's speaker. We'll probably use my introduction, but uh, he uh, did his PhD at Harvard with the Bill Press and then went off to the Institute um, and faculty positions at uh, Maryland and Princeton. And is currently the uh, chair of the uh, Princeton Economy Department and uh, sometimes uh, leading one of the uh, sub panels. In this area, what I see as the big science questions are how do planetary systems form and evolve? For addressing this, the work that's been done, uh, though it's quite remarkable, on Jupiter-class planets, I think it's has really been only looking at the tip of the iceberg. And we'd like to move down in the mass range to have lower mass planets and stock the light. Um, we'd like to look at, and once we start detecting planets, See what are the range of properties in planets. We suspect that our solar system is sampling only a small portion of that phase space. You know, what would a Neptune mass planet look like in a Earth orbit? I think the uh, Jovian Saturnian moons are showing just the range, some of the possibilities that might be out there. And you might imagine, and I think there's a very interesting system for you know, geologists to think about, which is you know, what happens if um, you have planets that are five Earth mass planets, do they have, um, uh, are they going to have um, plate tectonics? What's going to happen in systems like that? Um, I think one of the interesting things about thinking about these kinds of questions is, um, you know, I know I go and talk to colleagues who do uh, climatology, and uh, you ask them, what would the cloud patterns be like on a planet that doesn't have land, that only has the ocean? And they look at you like you're kind of nuts. I mean, I think one of the advantages of coming from cosmology into a field like this is we're used to thinking about the range of possibilities. A lot of people in this, well, many fields like climatology are used to solving real problems of what's the weather look like on the Earth and care about getting the details of the continents right. But we think this is kind of a fun opportunity to think more broadly uh, about uh, and learn about uh, planetary properties. And I think when we can look forward to um, directed 
original plan of saying the drug is drug. You can imagine, and I'll get to this as I go on my talk, being able to detect a, a terrestrial planet, seeing it as clouds, looking at the variability in the cloud patterns, measuring the, uh, how it varies through the year, what the coverage is, addressing a, a kind of, a, I think, a pretty rich range of interesting questions. And this, you know, to put this in the context, this has been a remarkable time in this area. This is a plot from the um, Exoplanet Task Force showing the um, numbers of published papers from zero to 3,000 uh, published per year, uh, a cumulative number of papers, the um, number of known exoplanets growing from, on this plot, zero to 150. And you can see this incredibly rapid growth. I think this plot runs out to 2005. The point for 2009 is around 300. So the plot, the curve continues to grow. And uh, looking forward to Kepler, I think we can expect an even more rapid increase in the number of planets. And uh, I think one can actually think about Kepler's observing program. Kepler is looking at a very large sample of stars, looking for um, occultation events when a planet gets in front of the star, dims it. Um, Kepler has already reported some very nice results on a known planetary system where they've seen the occultations due to the Jupiter-like planet. They've not published their error bars officially, but if you look at the plot and the scatter of the points, they thought they were clever and published the plot without any axes. But since it's a known system, you can turn to the plot with axes and calibrate it and realize the good news, which is Kepler's actually achieving its scientific goals, it looks like. Um, so I think we can look forward to it being capable of detecting Earth-like planets. And um, what Kepler will do is, um, I think that they will probably wait until they see at least three occupation events in a given target before they make, start making announcements. They want to be sure that these events are real. Um, so we can predict that there will be short period planets announced, I think probably within the year. Things with, you know, hot Jupiters, they will have many periods, strong signals, and we can think those, you know, those will happen. Um, there'll be planets that are potentially Earth mass size, maybe a little bit bigger, we'll see what their actual sensitivities are, detected at the orbit of Venus, probably announced about two, three years from now, let's say two or three Venus years. And probably about uh, three years from now, they will have had uh, time to analyze three orbital periods of an Earth-like planet. And they will be able to make an announcement that we, they are seeing Earth-like planets with a pretty high frequency. I like the optimism. Are you really convinced of what you just said? Am I convinced of which aspect? That in three years, uh, they, I mean, that they, they will have their uh, issues down well enough to be able to make such a strong statement. Um, I think it's a question of what uh, what their threshold is. So whether or not that number is five Earth masses or ten Earth masses, a one Earth mass, I think, will depend on the sensitivities. Um, but uh, talking to people involved with it, uh, they seem pretty optimistic. Well, so, if every so much started with Venus, how many would they see? Um, and, and they could be wizarding about Brickle. I think they see, what I remember was if the Earth-like fraction is of order of unity per system, they see tens of Earths. And Venus, you get more. So. They should know the Venus numbers. Well, they probably know internally some of these numbers already. In the pessimistic one, they, well, if they've achieved their sensitivities and they're not seeing events, that means there aren't many planets out there. Um, if they've achieved their sensitivities and they're seeing a bunch of things, it will take a while to understand. I mean, one of the things that you have to worry about when the events have a different structure but you have occultation events where you have a brown dwarf or a Jupiter mass planet glancing. Gives you a different kind of shape. But if you've got a lot of noise, you're not going to distinguish that. So it's a, uh, 
to accept making those kinds of separations and whether or not the signal to noise is good enough to do that, that I think will. So they, <coughs> your little exercise is backing out their errors from the clock. Yeah. What did you get for their uh, micromagnitude scale? Micro so if that's true, they will have no problem. That's, that's why I was optimistic about that. Yeah. I mean, that is their stated goal. On the that they will see. Yeah. That's, if you, you look at the thing on the, I just went to their website and then went to the paper on that day. You know, I, I actually have, a, I only did it by R because it's not something that's not uh, obvious, right? Yeah. But it's, it's micromax. I mean, that should be possible. I mean, I'm just worried about, I can't help it from here. Because the photon noise is kind of Some of these things you want, you like, it's not RV confirmation. Um, RV confirmation that it's not a Jupiter mass planet, mm -hmm. right? So you, know, you don't have to get to Earth mass. You can right. constrain. Right. You can rule, rule things out will help. Um, but this is actually just all supposed to be a, a teaser, <laughs> right? To say, I think it's plausible to imagine that uh, the public will hear, will have a very exciting result. Um, you know, the, by this point in time, the you know U.S. government will have made all the money it's going to make off of uh, selling its AIG stock back. That might be GM, and uh, then have money available for new big science projects, and the public will be excited. And this will be in the beginning of the second Obama administration, and we want to be ready. You know, this is my optimistic. Um, to uh, be able to say, you know, if we have this kind of result, people are going to wonder, can we image us? And what will it take to do it? And uh, I think this is, uh, you know, I'm most of it be thinking about this in the context of uh, the Cato survey. Um, but I think it's something we want to be ready to do to be able to come to the public and say, here's the path to go forward to uh, image earth like plants around the other stuff. So if we want to do this, what, what, what do we need to do? Well, the problem in detecting Earth is not um, so much get, seeing the photons from the planet. It's distinguishing the photons from the, the light of the nearby star. And uh, here is the, comparing the sun to Jupiter, Venus, Earth, um, and Mars, level the Zodi, and this Zodi plot depends on the resolution you're looking at. Um, it's a factor of 10 to the 9, basically, between the, the peak brightness of the Sun and the peak brightness of the Earth. And even Jupiter is pretty hard. I mean, Jupiter is only a factor of peak brighter than, uh, than the Earth. You can do better by going into infrared. Um, the ratio is more like to minus six to ten to minus seven, but then you face the uh, challenge of having a lot of zodi, and in particular, if you go to the far infrared or mid infrareds, you start you're looking now at very large systems that have to be cold, right? Because you, you, your resolution is set by lambda over d. So in order to have the resolving power, here's the problem that at ten parsecs, um, the angular separation between uh, Earth-like planet and the sun is only 100 milliard seconds. And uh, it's hard to see things at those separations. And that first problem, the way of understanding that problem, is just thinking a little bit about diffraction. So what I now want to do is kind of go through a bit of optics and talk about what are some of the challenges for, for getting this suppression, uh, this separate, and uh, what are some of the ideas on this. So let's just talk about what a telescope does, light comes in, the telescope has a diameter D. It focuses the telescope on the focal plane if I'm looking at a single wavelength. Of course, I get an area pattern. Now, we're used to thinking of the resolving power of the telescope being lambda over D. That's this width here. 
But really, the light from a, tel a classical telescope falls off very slowly with radius. So the airy pattern falls off as theta to the minus 3. So if I'd like to get far enough out in order to be able to see this Earth-like planet, I need a telescope that's more than a kilometer in diameter if I'm just taking a classical telescope and working that way. So we're going to do something to make this problem simpler. And just nice images to find what area winds look like. In a linear scale, they flow up pretty quickly. So if you're interested in separating two identical stars, and that's what the usual Raleigh criterion for the resolving cosmic telescope is based on, you know, it's true at 1.2 rand over D, you can separate things. But if you want to see something very dim, you have to be at a much wider separation. And even when we start talking about coronagraphs, you're going to see that even our most sensitive designs require working at several <coughs> And Given that um, D costs money, in fact, the diameter cost of an object scales is basically D cubed, you pay a big price for that. So how can we make things, how can we improve on things? Well, the, I think one of the simplest ideas to do this is just to change the shape of the telescope. And um, if I took my telescope, a simple ex uh, thought exercise is make the shape of the telescope look something like a Gaussian. And of course, a Gaussian goes extends to infinity, so make it Gaussian minus a constant, and the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So instead of falling off like theta to minus three, it falls off much more quickly. And in fact, you can get to a 10 to the minus 10 suppression by four lambda over d with a Gaussian telescope. And that starts to become plausible. Now with a four meter telescope, you could, with the right shape, In fact, if you want to actually make something in this sh shape, you should use a Gaussian, you should use a prolate spheroidal wave function. That's the function whose, um, if you have a finite interval, you want the most compact representation of it, you should use combined with a prolate spheroid. Um, this is no result known by, it goes back to a very elegant paper by Schleppian in 1966 on signal analysis. Um, for those of you who are doing any kind of data analysis where you want to convolve things with a finite window, these Slepian functions are very well suited for that. And Slepian makes a very nice connection between the, the solving a quantum mechanical problem of a particle in a square left, this gives a prolate spheroid, <coughs> and this optimal uh, function. Um, this is a, a filter that uh, is nice to know about. It's actually a filter we're using in the uh, effect of the act data to handle the finite size of the the box, um, and it's a good way to, to smooth things. Um, we don't really want to make our people shape like that. What we really actually want um, is something where we have something that may be, say, circularly symmetric. So we'd like to have some appetization function A of R. So the Fourier transform of the appetization looks like a nice Gaussian like seat circle. Uh, in fact, what we want are these two dimensional versions of the Slepian functions, which basically look like 2D Gaussian. And we'd like to appetize our mirror so that it looks like that. One way to do that would be to take the telescope mirror and put dots on it so that the, the reflectivity, instead of falling, going from 1 to 0 of the boundary, smoothly went from one in the center to a small value at the edge. Um, and this is something you actually don't have to do on the primary. You could put a, a filter along the light path that would act this way. But it's very hard to build a filter that at a part in 10 to the 5 has the right transmission properties in a wavelength in the 10 to the 5. So an alternative to that um, is to remind ourselves that um, a Fourier transform could also be written as a sum of Bessel functions. So if I make a mask that is an n-fold mask, n-fold symmetric, its Fourier 
transform is going to be the zero order term will be this, uh, will just be the width of the total area that lets light through. I can select that to be any function I want, A of R. So this gives me J0, gives me the optimization I want. And then the effect of these higher order terms are to give me in, in E field terms of the form Jn to the Kx, where n is the n fold symmetry. A nice property of Bessel functions is Jn of x goes as x to the n over n factorial in the small x limit, which implies that there's, um, these higher order corrections don't have much effect on small scales. They all send things out into the waves. We're going to actually use this principle later, so I just want to illustrate that. So here's uh, oh, a 20 pointed star. This is the average transmission as a function of radius. You can see you can get a small dark zone here. Here is the PSF of a 150 pointed star, where we can get a bright spot from the star here, a very large dark zone, and all of the structure, and this has a 150-fold symmetry, um, is way up here. And this now converts this problem of constructing a mass uh, into a much simpler mechanical problem. You just need something to cut a piece of metal that has the right shape with precision at the micron scale. This is actually pretty easy. You know, we uh, got some of these in the lab in Princeton. My colleague Jeremy Kazdu, mechanical and aerospace engineering, has been using these kinds of maths. And working with my car, who was the mechanical engineer responsible for a lot of Sloan, um, we, you know, this company in Philadelphia that basically cut the maths to what we needed for a couple of thousand dollars or something to one of these things. Kind of relatively uh, off the shelf technology to cut that. So the notion here just to think that we're not putting this on the front end of the telescope, is what you do is you bring the light to a secondary, you create a new pupil plane, and instead of using a conventional pupil or this apodized pupil, you put one of these shaped pupils in and get the appropriate PSF behind it. This pupil, the shaped pupil approach, which is one I'll show some results from, is actually now one of many uh, coronagraph designs. Uh, this is an area <coughs> that because of the interest in the exoplanets, it really kind of blossoms a little kind of subfield. It is, you know, years ago we just had this classical Leo coronagraph, and in the past, say, 10 years, people have proposed a variety of approaches to achieving uh, to get, uh, for, for coronagraphs. I've talked about the shaped pupils because I think it's the simplest to explain and because it's one that I play a role in developing. Um, but one that I think is very interesting is this pupil remapping approach. Um, let me just uh, flash up a few slides on that. Um, this is developed by a number of folks. Uh, Olivier Guillon in Arizona, uh, Bob Vanderbilt, Wes Trout, um, and others. And, um, the idea here is we want to apodize our wave function. We want to get our E-field to look like this Gaussian or proliate spheroid in cross-section here. So when we take its Fourier transform, it's going to give us a nice bright spot that falls off very quickly. But we'll, instead of controlling the wave function shape by letting only a fraction of light through, you change the shapes you make some specially shaped mirrors so that you take the light, say, at the edge and spread it out quite broadly while you take the light in the center and keep it concentrated. And what you can do is design your primary and secondary so that um, you can transmit all the light from the star and the planet. You're not blocking anything. And, um, achieve the same concentrated wave function. And uh, this, I think, has the promise of getting in as close as 2 lambda over d and detecting planets. Okay, so we
we've actually, I think, solved the problem of the fracture lab. And if we could build a perfect telescope, there are um, technologies we have in the lab today that meet the requirements of the future. The challenge is that the mirrors we have are not perfect, that the mirror segments have imperfections. And those imperfections scatter light and make speckles that look a lot like planets because you're having light that comes in a slightly different path. And in fact, if I think about the requirements I need for a primary mirror to see an Earth-like planet, the surface of the mirror has to be good to about a part, delta lambda over lambda, about a part in 10 to the 4. Maybe close a little bit better than that, more like a few parts in 10 to the 5, in order for the uh, scattered light from mirror perfection to not look brighter than the planet. And that's a tr very difficult requirement to put on a mirror. Typical mirrors are good to, you know, land over 20. So getting mirror, big mirrors in space that are land over 10 to the 4 is pretty hopeless. And not only does the uh, phase, so the shape of the mirror have to be accurate at that level, we need to worry about the reflectivity of the mirror and can't have reflectivity variations like that. So we need to find some way to correct this. And the basic idea is to use some kind of wavefront control algorithms where we sense the errors in the wavefront and then use a deformable mirror to um, deform the shape of this little deformable mirror so it matches the imperfections in the primary and corrects for it. And this is something that we've been achieving in the lab. And uh, here's actually some, a nice figure from um, showing this kind of dark hole. This is a contrast ratio achieved with a deformable mirror with the PIAA technology. This is work by Russ Belikoff, uh, one of our, uh, our former postdocs is now at NASA. Aims um, using this PIA technology to achieve a dark hole of a few parts in 10 to the 8. And this shows where these different technologies are in terms of the contrast ratio they need versus bandwidth. And this is sort of where we need to get to this 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 8 range. And you can see at a few lambda over D, 3 to 4 lambda over D, We've already gotten into the right range in the lab in terms of contrast. And these new approaches like PIAA, this plot shows the 10 to minus 7, because um, this was generated two months ago. This is a plot less than a month old. We've already pushed down to here. And I think one could be quite hopeful that in the next couple of years, a lot of these approaches will be down towards the 10 to minus 10 range in terms of what contrast we can achieve in the lab. Um, so this is, I think, the good news about coronagraphs, that we can make things work in the lab. But the challenge is that uh, we've got to put this on a really big telescope. Even if we're working at two lambda over D, to achieve a, in a working angle of 75 milliarc seconds in a micron, so to be able to, to uh, characterize the, you know, things like, um, water in uh, the planetary atmospheres on, uh, by getting out to those light ones is going to require a really good telescope. You're looking at a um, six meter class telescope and it's got to be an off-axis telescope and one of the challenges when you start looking at telescope design is that these wavefront control algorithms can only correct for mirror imperfections on time scales comparable, you know, that are long compared to the time it takes the information get the information to measure the wave from depth. And those, that time scales are typically going to be minutes. So this telescope has to be incredibly stable thermally and mechanically on these very long time scales. Right, so it's going to involve probably flying something to L2, uh, keeping the telescope perhaps rotating to keep thermal gradients on it small. Um, and it's something that's been studied quite actively as part of the TPF effort, um, but it's not going to be easy. 
Now, just to give a sense of some of the progress on the point, various things on the ground, once I show some results from the Subaru telescope. This is uh, using the adaptive optics system on Subaru with the high shout uh, chronograph, which is a classical Leo chronograph. Um, this chronograph is being used as part of a program we call SEEDS. Um, Princeton and, and it, the National Observatory of Japan has entered into a collaborative agreement where we're working together on large strategic projects. This is something that will have 120 nights of observing time at Subaru. And the plan is to do a direct imaging and census of giant planets around solar type stars, particularly looking at outer disk regions, look at protoplanetary disks, try to make the connection between uh, planets and disks. And one of the things that we'll do with all this data, besides showing the results, is we will make all the data public for people who are interested in looking at this kind of data um, as a service. Um, already using um, Tech and Gemini, there have been discoveries of, of extrasolar planets. And what I want to show you today is some results that came out during the um, engineering phase here. So one of the things we, my colleagues did was, and this is work led by Michael McElwain, a postdoc at Princeton, who um, led me these slides. They uh, looked at uh, one of the engineering targets, a nearby G8 star, did this um, what's called um, uh, angular differential imaging. So you look at the, uh, take advantage of the fact that if you rotate the telescopes, the speckles move on the sky, but the planet doesn't. And then average, and uh, what they found is shown here, they detected, and fortunately, just like with supernova, it turns out, new, newly discovered planets come with arrows. So if you, you see, you know, they line up, the arrows show up in the data, and uh, point to both uh, detection and an uh, intriguing potential detection, this, this C image. Both of these things have been observed separated by three months. They show the proper motion of the star. Um, these are the background stars in the same field. And uh, it looks like this G8 star has a um, planet slash brown dwarf. The mass range here is such that it's on the border between the two. Um, at separations of about 40 a year. And I think I was talking with Andrew over coffee. This is an interesting, these kinds of systems I think are going to be interesting challenges for people thinking about planet formation. What is the flux difference in uh, so the, the flux difference is, uh, these are H band of 14.5 magnitudes. Right, so it's 30 magnitudes, sorry, 25 magnitudes for an Earth. So, you know, getting 15 is, is good, but, we, but you know, you're not going to get the 25, I think, from the ground at least soon. So is there, you know, this, yeah. Um, it's a little bit, uh, well, this is its inferred mass, so I guess it's a little bit brighter. <laughs> Given the errors, I don't know how to read those, read those numbers. Um, this is a paper that's, I think, going to be submitted quite soon. Um, you know, it's great to see the system, but I think a lot, the fact that this was seen during the engineering phase means I think we could look forward to seeing many more objects as these surfaces go on. Um, well, these coronagraphs are interesting, but is there a better way to do this? Is there some other way? Yes, good question. Uh, that's, is that a machine? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the dark or dust is an issue in two ways. Uh, okay, go on. I was actually asking a more specific question. But oh, oh, it's dust on the telescope. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dust in the telescope gets a, gets a wide angle scatter. So it's, uh, what, what kills you is things that scatter light at very small angular separations. So if you think about this as four modes on the telescope, dust grains just scatter light everywhere. It's just a but if you've got some imperfection that, whose wavelength is of order uh, 
four modes across the telescope, it scatters light at four lambda over d, which is where your planet is. So it's these uh, large scale imperfections in telescope surface. Um, so diacal dust in treacherous exosodes of diacal dust is a worry in two ways. Um, it's a source of background noise, and it means that systems that have large ex exosodes compared to Earth like systems um, are going to be hard to image. But it's also a source of confusion because exosodes can be lumpy, and uh, that will be an additional source of noise. Okay, can we find some other way of doing this? You know, and can we find some way to, you know, your bright light just kind of want to block it with your hand and look around it. And this idea of flying the culture, so you have your telescope here, a separate satellite here <coughs> that blocks the light from the star. And look at the planet here. It would be a very nice way of using a general purpose telescope and suppressing the star light. Well, if you do the easiest thing to think about, which is fly a big solid disk, and you try to fly a lot of light with this, that doesn't work well. In fact, that's a problem. This is it for now or every solve, and one of them did prize for it. Must be for now. Because you can figure out for now spot. So what it will do is create a nice spot behind you. That's a, it's a nice one off this problem you said to this guy from the right? But as we'll see, if we appetize the culture, we can achieve significant suppression. And this is an idea that goes back at least to one of Spitzer. This is from um, a wonderful uh, article that Lyman Spitzer wrote in 1962, which I actually recommend digging up and looking at on um, the future of space from laying out what he thinks are important problems to work on. And so let me just read this. This is so great. From 1962, what Lyman wrote. Uh, one problem of particular interest that would be emphasized here as an important part of the long term program is detection of planets around other stars. This is a matter of great philosophical and cultural as well as scientific interest. The detection of extrasolar planets is an extraordinary difficult problem. Fortunately, there's a better way of detecting extrasolar planets around other stars, a method pointed out by Danielson. This method involves the use of uh, Danielson was an assistant professor at Princeton who passed away early, for a young and uh, use of an occulting disk far in front of the telescope to reduce some light from the star. The shadow of the disk can be made much blacker if the transparency of the occulted disk very smoothly with the edge rather than abruptly. That's the same principle of atomization we talked about already. And two specific examples achieve the reduction of several orders of magnitude. This is for helial seismology in the docks um, with the use of an occulting disk edge with spikes. So that's basically what we're going to do. Instead of using a Poisson spot, and we want to try to capitalize it. And this is something that was explored in the 90s by a number of groups. Uh, uh, Glenn Starkman, a former citizen. Um, how do I pronounce that? Is that right? Citizen. Um, developed this idea of using a big a culture like this where you appetize the transmissivity, which turns out to be technically challenging. Um, and there was a group of Goddard that developed a similar kind of approach. But I think what looks much more attractive is to do an appetization and control the shape. So now our problem of appetization looks just like the inverse, really, of our problem of making a mass. We, we want to eat. We, this is the electric field um, in, in the plane of the telescope. If we put an appetizing source here, again, it's the same kind of Fourier transform. The correction you have to make for Fresnel optics is that the waves aren't at infinity. You have to include the curvature in the wave front. And that's what the Fresnel term does, right? This, this Fresnel term is nothing more than I'm propagating photons from here to here. And the app, this screen here is not at constant distance. The distance, which is R, you know, squared plus u squared, you take this, expand this out in the limit of z smaller than R, the first order term in the expansion, in the e to the ikx term. 
is all the phenomenal journeys. So you want to do the Fresnel integral, and now you do the same trick. So you fly a star-shaped mask. It's a Fresnel transform. It's a nice big dark region with all this scattered light ending up out here from the spikes. And you fly the telescope mm -hmm. in the dark hole. And here are some different designs that my colleague Bob Vanderhei um, developed. He's a, he's a guy in our uh, He's chairman of Operations Research and Financial Engineering, and he's an expert in optimization. So it doesn't matter what you optimize. And, you know, rather than converting, I think a few of us were talking earlier about our, our colleagues who went over to the dark side and worked on finance. Bob is someone who saw the light. He's chair of our fine financial engineering department, and his last several papers are in the astrophysical journal. <coughs> And uh, Web Cash, a group in Colorado, has been developing these ki same kinds of ideas. Web is actually implementing some of the things in the lab where you take a star shape like that, and this is a little guy, 35 millimeters, you build up a scale version, and Fresnel Optics works and sees the nice star holes that you expect to see. The notion that you could fly your tiny telescope. So motivated by this possibility, one of the things I've been looking at over the last couple of years is um, thinking about could we build a telescope to do this? And I put together a, a group to study a telescope that we've nicknamed uh, THEA, the Telescope for Habitable Earth's Interstellar Intergalactic Astronomy. And what we wanted to look at was building a JWST and Hubble successor. And uh, so this is a, a four meter telescope with that was capable of this capable and optical and ultraviolet. We combined in this study with our uh, Ken Sembach and his group at the Space Telescope Institute looking at flying a UV spectrograph. Paul Scowan and his group at Arizona State looking at flying a very large optical and UV imager. And uh, working with uh, a large group of people, I think we had 70 people on this study at various points of what we might do with a large telescope in space. We have developed a broad observing program for um, general astrophysics, but the things that we focused on for planet finding was building something that would be capable of detecting a planet in B-band, looking at its atmosphere by measuring its colors, detect Raleigh scattering in the atmosphere, looking for an upturn to measure the atmospheric pressure, look for biomarkers, looking for oxygen, methane, water, and ozone. Uh, kind of a goal would be to search for the presence of life by looking for something called the red edge. Um, plant life, of course, absorbs visible light for photosynthesis. That makes it heat up. If you're in the water, that's not a problem. If you're plant life on the surface, you have to avoid overheating, so you want to reflect infrared light. Almost all plant life, land plant life on Earth, has this feature called the red edge, where the reflectivity of plant life jumps up sharply at about um, 700 nanometers, just outside the edge of where our eyes see. In fact, if our eyes extend a little bit further than the infrared, fresh um, a lawn of, of green grass would look brighter than freshly fallen snow. It's that the reflectivity is is much higher than light, than light snow. Um, and uh, this is probably an evolutionary thing to stop from overheating. Our eyes probably cut off near there because we don't want to be swamped by that useless information of very white uniform reflectivity. This is something used by our uh, by military intelligence because you can distinguish plant life from camouflage by looking at the reflectivity properties in the infrared. So it could be that this kind of feature is an evolutionary thing that's a sign of light. And it's actually something we'd like to have as a goal of detectability. And uh, we'd like to be able to monitor the flux from the planet as a function of time. If you look at the Earth from space, you expect to see a day, till the day's time scale variability for planet rotation, and also longer variability due to uh, climate. 
But here's the basic telescope design. The notion is to in order to have a very wide field, a three mirror astigmat. We want to look at a design that would work into the UV. In fact, into the uh, far enough into the UV that we can, so our UV colleagues using the UV spectrograph can study interesting lines in our galaxy. So what we came up with was the notion of using a MAC fluoride primary and a lithium fluoride secondary. Lithium fluoride has better transmission properties, but it's harder to work with, and this compromise looks good. Um, and then we have a series of chapters on that. And this is sort of some simulated spectrum of what we could hope to see observing the Earth with this telescope at 10 parsecs. And our simulated spectra shows we could see in the Earth, a, bil a billion year old Earth, the methane in the water, in the two and a half billion year old Earth atmospheres, these same features, and start to detect the initial growth of the oxygen abundance by seeing ozone. Ozone is a very nonlinear indicator of oxygen. Once you start to have a modest amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, you get the ozone absorption that saturates. So low oxygen abundance, you have the ozone feature, but don't have the O2 line. And as the oxygen abundance rises to today's values, you see both oxygen and ozone. And this shows some numbers on the expected number of detectable planets. And um, I, we're looking, depending on the fraction of Earth-like planets, as we go up to one per system, being able to um, detect maybe 40 planet detections, um, spectrally characterized after 700 nanometers, um, most of those planets, and being able to look, go all the way to a micron to pick up these important features here on, on 15 systems. So you're looking at, I think, a, a, a lot of objects from a, system, a, a telescope like this if the fraction of Earth-like planets are large. And we'll know that from that. As the Earth-like fraction drops, these numbers, of course, drop. Um, there's some interesting, I don't know if I'll talk about this, uh, finish up soon. So interesting, you have to fly these things information, I can figure out how to optimize that. Um, when we actually look at the occulter, what I think is the challenge for this technology is you've got to fly this large occulter in space. And this occulter is quite big. It's about 40 to 50 meters in diameter. You've got to build a large deployable system like this. Um, while NASA has never flown anything like this, if you Google lacrosse spy satellite, you will find that our industry partners have built things like this for other agencies. Um, NASA's man, um, science program, robotic space program, represents a small percentage of the U.S. budget spent in space. So we can, there's sometimes opportunities to exploit other technologies. So you're saying this has already been used? What? You said, you're saying this has already been built and used? No. Th think 40 meter deployables have been used. No. Um, 40 meter deployables that uh, say listen in on <coughs> satellite phone calls, which require that the um, you know, land over 20 objects. Um, in the radio, the research requirement. Turns out that what we want to do is probably about a factor few, three to ten, I don't actually know the numbers, um, better than what they can do now for array, things that are ready to deploy. Um, but, you know, that means we have to test this. We need to make sure it maintains its shape. We have to worry about thermal gradients across this um, your culture. And your stuff. So what we're looking at now is we've got a proposal into NASA to build a single pedal at JPL. Deploy it, test it, expose it to thermal mechanical gradients, make sure we can understand them, and so, so that we can achieve this faster fuel improvement that we need for this. Um, here's some stuff on the control problem, how we keep them aligned, and skip that and just say a little bit about some of the applications for this. Um, one idea that uh, Randy Sumer at Space Telescope Institute and Webb Cash have been talking about 
is flying a similar approach to design um, with JWST. This has, I think, two significant advantages. JWST is going to be launched soon, and it's a big telescope for flying away. There's some disadvantages. Um, JWST is a big telescope. You've got to build a really big culture to make a big enough dark hole. At least 60 meters tip to tip, which is bigger than anything anyone's deployed in space. Um, it, JWST is diffraction limited to microns. So it's not worth great for imaging these things. It requires adding new filters. And what I think makes it hardest is the occulter has to have all the responsibility for lining up with JWST. At, you've got to keep the telescope lined up with the occulter at better than the meter scale. And your errors have to be, you know, what are 50 centimeters in alignment for things separated by, you know, uh, thousands of uh, kilometers. And that relative positioning has to be done by imaging JWST from the occulter. What does that do to the aperture of the occulter? The size of the occulter? Yes. Um, well, at fixed wavelength, you want to be um, big enough that you create a dark hole that you can get the telescope in. The further you move, um, move the, tel the occulter away, the, uh, the bigger the occulter has to be to create a dark hole. But then the occulter blocks less of the sky. So for fixed in a working angle, there's a minimum occulter size. Make the culture um, smaller by going to shorter wavelengths. That's the way they tend to scale. One of the dis approaches that a number of us are now considering is flying a smaller telescope, a one to one and a half meter telescope. Turns out you can buy a one meter telescope very cheaply. They're commercially available. Um, for, you know, uh, and uh, with a smaller telescope, you can fly a smaller culture and while you can um, because the capabilities of these the systems what inner working end you can get at is um, determined by the culture size um, you can actually take this small telescope and be able to image an earth-like planet with it and this seems to be as far as I know the cheapest path to get an image of an earth-like planet now because the telescope is smaller we're looking here at only getting um, photometry, not getting spectroscopy. You won't be able to do things like spectroscopy and that many lines. We will, though, be able to potentially pick up the ozone feature. And, you know, when the culture is moving to the target, target, this would certainly be a nice telescope to have for general astrophysics. So let me conclude. I think if we look at the history of astronomy and think about what's driven what we want to do, over the last century, basically, we built bigger and bigger telescopes. You know, if you go from Hubble to you know, ground base to Hubble to JWST, and it was a design driven by doing cosmology. We want to measure a couple of times, we want to study the first dot stars and the first galaxies. And what I view as kind of history of the last 50 to 100 years is we've built these telescopes for cosmology and done lots of great cosmology in general astrophysics. What I think will happen over the next hundred years is as we try to image and characterize and learn more about habitable planets around nearby stars, um, we will build bigger and bigger telescopes and that um, these will be used for general astrophysics and drive the field forward. And uh, what I try to outline is what the requirements are as we think about the next steps in building these telescopes um, for searching for life beyond them. Let me stop there.
not do things, and it doesn't have spectral capability with the oxygen lamps. So you're not going to see oxygen, Raleigh scattering, and things like that. Um, JWST is also not devoting 100% of its time to plants, so of course you, you, you lose that. Um, and um, because JWST is actually diffraction limited to 2 microns, um, JWST diffraction limited to 2 microns for imaging these things has about the same image quality as a uh, you know, one and a half meter operating at half a micron. And the four meter at half a micron is much better. So in terms of numbers of planet detection and numbers of planet characterization, we do much better with the four meter that's diffraction limited the actual you know, diffraction limited point three microns versus JWST diffraction limited two microns. Remember that you've got to um, get enough photons from that planet against the the background of residual diffractive light. And if you're, um, as a result, as the planet image gets bigger on your image plane, that gets progressively farther in the background of the planet. And it's worth the cost of the work. So JWST, I think, is um, potentially an interim solution. My own preference is actually that uh, you, since the cost of the one meter telescope is very small compared to the cost of it in this case. But the cost of the telescope comes to satellite carries it. It's only about twenty million dollars for one meter telescope. You can fly that so much less. And then instead of having to maneuver the culture around to line it up, um, and having to um, track the telescope JWST and do everything and figure out what JWST is from the culture, which is a very hard problem. You can, the telescope is now, and its satellite, is now lighter than the occulter. So you keep the occulter fixed and fly the telescope around and position it. And the telescope can sense quite easily where it is in the shadow. Because while the shadow is very dark, say, in the visible, if you go to the near infrared, the shadow leaks. And it looks as a function of position. You've got a gradient actually across the planet. So you, um, and for control, you want to control something to have a nice gradient. In fact, I flip very quickly through those slides. That is actually some work done by uh, some of the undergraduates in our outer space engineering department for their senior thesis, which uh, uh, Jeremy Tyson, my colleague there, um, where they've actually designed a control system um, based on using the gradients across the PSF and shown that, that you know, simulated that with noise and shown that would, would work as a closed loop system. So we think we, we actually know how to handle a lot of those problems with the smells. Yes? If you find the Earth like climate with the one in the telescope, is it easier to build a separate system to use the trust of the or to make an occulted that gives a dark spot on the star and a bright spot at the location of the planet? Um, well, if you want just the cross to be just with a one and a half meter which fundamentally the planet's only a 30th magnitude object. It's just a lot of information. In principle, you can do it if you just have to keep the information forever. But I, I think we can't make the occulter for a long time. For, for, so how the occulter serve as a focusing device? You can gain a little bit, actually. You know, in fact, if you get the planet right in between the um, petals, that actually serves as uh, amplifies it by about uh, 30, 40 percent. Something. Um, I think my, my view is if we can build the uh, a culture, show that it works with the one meter. Building a four meter is not you know, it's hard, but it's not that hard. There are test facilities that exist for four meter telescopes. So they, this may be a side problem. like that, and 
and then pulled in here, and these are cross supports. Um, this has been designed to fit inside a, um, the launch vehicle of a Delta IV, and um, then have um, two-step two deployment. And um, this is something where I rely on our colleagues at Lockheed Martin, but they feel that um, the deployment of this particular design is not hard. You know, if it was constructed, uh, what they're more worried about is can they manufacture and verify the edges have the right shape accurately enough, and uh, to make sure that the thermal gradients across the across the, the culprit as it sits there with the sun lighting one part but not the other um, are not going to distort the shapes. And um, the requirements on the shape of your culture are kind of at the millimeter level. Um, and it's at the level where the thermal, they would be relying on thermal modeling because you cannot test this in the ground in zero G. Um, and they believe their thermal models are accurate at this level, but they've not been rigorously tested. So it's with these thermal mechanical issues and things when I ask them what worries them. basically half of NASA's budget for the next decade. So it says if NASA builds one big thing after JWST, it's that class of project. So it's feasible, but certainly only worth doing if it's the major, you know, if we convince that's the major project to do it uh, this time. Um, I think we could do the one meter class system for certainly under a billion given the culture cost of the dominant one, um, and potentially for more like seven, 650 to 750 million. What we're doing right now is um, doing a small study with our colleagues at JPL, um, looking at that possibility and um, thinking about um, uh, you know, if NASA decides to have a Probe class AO um, to be able to put together a competitive proposal, build something that's class, actually go to images. And we're, we're working on that now. We'll actually have um, a, hopefully at least one poster of the AAS that will report some initial plan uh, results on that. What's the cost of the culture for JWST? The culture for JWST, um, you know, Web Cash, who's, in, who's an enthusiast for this, would say less than the number I'll quote, but you know, we found that in our study, a 40 meter of culture um, was going to cost um, a border $700 million. And this is a bigger culture, it's 60 meters, which requires um, 
going beyond the size of what people are deployed to have. It also has to be able to do all the sensing and control. So that makes it a much more complicated system. So I think that it's a, its costs are probably at least double to one and a half billion. And what's probably a non-trivial cost is if you're operating together with JWST, you're changing JW's operation modes. And one of the things you don't want to do on a major project, in fact, you don't want to do on your own construction, is once you've gone to the contractor, don't change what you asked for. The costs for deltas are very large. Now, someone having a kitchen redone right now, I keep explaining this to my wife, but it's not succeeding. <laughs> which will drive our costs. We have to stick with what we want. But I think it's especially affecting a good mission like JW is a, uh, will make the cost even higher. So I, I think a, a more realistic end to end cost is more like JW. Uh, and I think we do a one meter, which will give, I think, actually greater science because there's always the wavelength coverage um, for much less. Okay, well, we'll just probably wrap up. Uh,